Today's reading is from Romans 13, verses 11 through 14. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is, time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now when we, than when we first believed. The night is almost gone, the day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness, or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living, or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Two things. Um, so our box total for Operation Christmas Child this year was 1414, 1, 1,414 boxes. So uh, that's good. I mean, I wasn't sure we were going to get there. That's in our sweet spot, around 1,500, give or take a couple hundred. We always seem to end up there, so I'm thankful for that. Uh, Kylie and everybody did a great job, uh, so thanks to their work. Uh, number two, the, the sanctuary looks great, and that's Christine and Peggy uh, working on a short week, uh, so we're thankful for them. And who else? Oh, and Linda helped out too, so I'm sorry, Linda, but I didn't mean to leave you out. So that's great. Uh, we got all that done. Um, and now let's talk about the text this morning, Romans 13, 11 through 14. I'm going to talk about something as I open that's kind of a touchy subject in our day, but I'm going to just talk about appropriate dress, attire, fashion. Um, when I was growing up, both men and boys wore a suit to church. That was just the expected thing. I'm not saying what we do today is wrong. I'm just relaying to you my experience when I was a little kid. Uh, back in the 60s, 50s, 40s, I think, I mean, at least in, where I was, everybody wore a dark suit, white shirt, dark tie, dark, uh, dark shoes, dress shoes. This was just the way it was. Now, I do have a picture of our family uh, somewhere where, uh, and women wore dresses, of course. Uh, they wore white gloves. They wore a hat with a veil. Uh, that was just expected procedure. Um, I have a picture of me with my family, and I'm just a little tyke, and I got shorts on, so maybe that's where that tradition came from. I don't know. With dark socks and dress shoes, by the way, and, uh, and a white shirt and a bow tie. So, But, I mean, the ex expectation on Sundays back then was if you show up, you're going to be dressed appropriately. Uh, about, what, 20 years ago, uh, the Queen of England came to Freeport in the Bahamas to dedicate the Garnett Laverty Law Center, uh, uh, which was named after Claudette's dad. And uh, if you were going to be there, it's a big deal. This is the Queen of England. Um, but you had to show up wearing appropriate attire to that as well. You couldn't just show up to meet the Queen in whatever. Uh, so if you were in the party that was close, like Laverty, the, the Laverty women, all had to have white gloves on. Uh, they were told uh, what color dresses they could have because you couldn't clash with whatever the queen was wearing. There was a strict protocol in regards to how this was going to work out. Um, I was at a funeral this past week. And just uh, survey the room, class. What, what's a what color is typically associated with a funeral? Thank you. There's somebody who showed up wearing all white. But, uh, you know, <laughs> so be it. That's the way it goes today. Um, uh, Ernest sometimes talks about attire at John Deere. He's not talking about factory workers. He's talking about the guys who work in the office. And he says, uh, at, you know, and we're in a very casual time in our society. Uh, but he says, even in our casual situation, sometimes they have to remind some of these guys who are in the office they need to dress a little more professionally. Um, uh, when I worked at the Drop Forge at the Bethlehem Steel, there were things I had to wear. I was in the plant in front of furnaces. I had to have safety glasses. I had to have a helmet. I had to have metatarsal safety shoes. I had to have long underwear under my clothes to insulate me from the furnace heat. Uh, winter or summer, it didn't matter. And if I didn't have the appropriate clothing, guess who was going to 
be told to go home for the day, me. Uh, there was absolutely no creativity in what I could wear on the job. We live in a really different place right now. That's just uh, the truth of the matter. But Paul reminds the Romans that there is an appropriate dress code for Christians. He's using this metaphor of dress here. And the dress code begins uh, by being spelled out of verses 9 through 10, which were not read this morning, but I'll read them to you today. Uh, he writes, Owe nothing to anyone. Don't be in debt to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirement of God's law. For the commandments say, You must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal. Uh, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others. So love fulfills the requirement of God's law. Paul is reminding the church in Rome about a singularly important characteristic of the people who are followers of God through Jesus Christ. Now, maybe there could be some divisions about what it means to be a Christian, but Paul would say at this point in time, when we deal with this one issue, there should be no division. There should be unity across all aspects of Christianity that we are to be showing love to people. That should be our core value. It should be our constant struggle to do. And I say struggle because it's not like we're perfect people and we will love everyone all the time. But that is our call. That is our target. That's what we're aiming at. That's what Paul is telling this Roman church. If you're going to be different in a polytheistic atmosphere that Rome was, you need to be demonstrating love because love fulfills all of the commandments of God that you can find in the Old Testament. And it is clear to all sane people what is not lovable when it comes to actions. He says there's no coveting. No murder, no adultery, no stealing, and just stuff like that. These are actions that are in their essence selfish and self-centered when they are practiced. You might want to give reasons why you do such things, but ultimately we do those kinds of things to satisfy something inside us, and they have nothing to do with the people we affect or the God we worship. Now, it is also clear to me that not everyone actually understands this concept. While Hank and I served on the foster care review, review board here in Dubuque, we would come across parents whose children were removed through the courts because of some kind of violence in the home. Typically, they would find drug paraphernalia, and then they would do a hair stat on that child, and they would find that there were drugs in that child's system in some way, shape, or form. Not that the kids ingested it or anything, but they're, they're now tainted. Uh, they were in a dangerous environment. So the children would be taken out of the home. And now as foster care review board, we were now their advocates to make sure that the courts were doing what they needed to do to make sure these kids were taken care of. Invariably, the parents would come in and meet with us. The parents were getting uh, urine tests at any time to make sure they're not using uh, they were asked to not uh, use drugs anymore. They would always tell us, we love our kids, or if it's a dad, I love my kid. And we had been doing this long enough to know that we didn't think they didn't love their kid. But what we did come to realize is there's emotive love, which I think they all had, but that what they lacked was actionable love. So actionable love would be uh, it was drugs that had your kids taken away. Stop the drugs, your kids come back into your house. So actionable love would actually to become to give up this thing that you love, the drugs, for the, th the, the child you claim you love. Uh, it's hard, but that's what would have to happen. Many times it wouldn't. So in order to get their children back, they would have to love their kids in an actionable way. And Paul is reminding the Roman church that love, while having elements of feeling or emotion, is, is more important when it is demonstrated in actionable terms. So this is true when faced with the imminent return of Christ, meaning Christ could come at any moment. Maybe we're kind of uh, 
uh, hardened by the fact that th these words were written over 2,000 years ago by now, and imminent seems to be kind of not the fitting idea of the return of Christ after thousands of years. But the reality is Christ could come at any moment, just like there's many things in your life that could come at any moment because you don't know what the future holds. Uh, there's a story in the Bible about ten maidens who are uh, at a wedding, waiting outside a wedding feast, waiting for the groom to show up, and they each have oil lamps. Half of them have enough oil to last because they have no idea when the groomsman and the groom is going to show up. And the other half have just basically bought enough oil to get by. And, when the, and then suddenly they run out and they ask for the oil of the other five. And they say, no, we have what we need, so you need to go out and buy it. So while they're gone purchasing the oil, that's when the groom comes back. And they miss out on the wedding feast because they were not prepared. And that's what Paul is saying here, is we need to be prepared. We need to be aware. We need to wake up. He tells these Roman Christians that they need to wake up and be prepared. And he wants us to be in the same mind as well. Now, maybe not Paul, but God does, because it's in his scripture. So in verses 11 through 12a, this is what we read. This is all the more urgent, for you know how love, loving people, is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. The day of salvation being the return of Christ. Paul believes that Christ will come in his lifetime. He was wrong. But he's telling people to wake up because it's imminent. It's important because much of the time it appears that Christians are sleepwalking. Like it says in Corinthians, you really don't care about the Lord's Supper. You don't care about taking care of communion. Paul could have said at that point, wake up, remember what the communion is all about, and get on with your life. Love one another. Because the way we know that they didn't care about the Lord's Supper is that basically it became personal eating time versus sharing time so that everybody would have enough in the Corinthian church. But here in Rome, he's saying, you got to wake up and face the reality because the time is short. Anytime we're engaged in something important, any kind of important project, it's really important that we be awake and aware of what's going on around us. Take driving, for example. So driving is an important thing. Not only could uh, a failure in this issue impact you, it could also impact the people who are in the lane next to you or behind you or in front of you or a pedestrian on the sidewalk. It's really important that we be awake. So when you're on those long drives, invariably, as careful as you are, you will find yourself nodding off. And now you have a decision to make. It's time for a coffee stop. It's time for a restroom break. It's time for something. Get out in the cold air, walk around. You got to wake up because you're a danger to yourself, whoever's in the car with you, and the people who are around you. In some instances, the people in our networks, uh, by the way, are more moral because Paul's saying, wake up, live a life different, uh, live a life of love. Uh, and we find sometimes that there are people who live around us, our neighbors or the person in the cubicle or in the factory line, who are actually more moral and loving than we are. And if that's the case, and it can be the case, then certainly we need to wake up and be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ that lives within us so that we can at least minimally be at the moral and loving level of the culture in which we're living. We shouldn't be dipping below it. Paul continues, uh, he says, So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living because we belong to the day. We must live decent lives for all to see. He's making this comment, there are things that are done at night and there are things that are done during the day. And since Christ is the stuff that is done in the day, we have been transformed from night creatures to day creatures through Jesus Christ. We should put off the things that we do at night. We have been saved through Jesus Christ the Lord. We're encouraged to embrace the power of his might, 
to live transformed lives. Now, you might feel like my life isn't transformed. Well, that's not because God doesn't want it to be transformed. It's about us embracing the power to be different people than the person we have been since the day we were born. We need to put on, he says, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to peel off the dirty clothes. We need to put on the shining armor of right living. We need to make a transition or transformation about how we live in this world. And it should be noticeable by people around us. This isn't just something that happens internally to you and me. And we can kind of sit while we watch the Packers this afternoon and say to ourselves, oh, what a good person I am. I'm different. I used to yell at the Packers. I don't yell at them anymore. And the only people who know that are you and whoever your spouse is because no one else is in the room with you. No, this transformed life should be something that is noticeable at work, at the food store, at the gas station, uh, with your auto repair person when he drops a big bill in your lap. Uh, all these situations are where we, this new transformed lifestyle, the armor of light, should be noticeable and indeed uh, something that is is uh, that we can see has changed, that we suddenly live with a higher understanding of our purpose no matter where we are, no matter what we do, uh, no matter what our job is, the higher purpose is to glorify God in all that we do, and that's what it means to put on the armor of light, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just trying to emulate or copy Jesus, it's to live in relationship with Jesus and allow that relationship to change over time, but it will not occur if we do not want it to occur. There are times when we will say, I am not ready to change. I like me the way I am. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ will allow you to stay there, but he invites you to become someone other than that. He invites you to move into a better, healthier situation than where you are. So since we belong to Jesus, we should live like we belong to Jesus. Again, we're in that relationship with Jesus, and it should be influencing us and changing us. He continues, he said, Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness, or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living, or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and don't let yourselves think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Perhaps many of us in this room have never participated in wild parties and drunkenness or sexual promiscuity and immoral living, at least the way these, these words put pictures in our head. But perhaps we have quarreled and perhaps we have demonstrated jealousy and perhaps we have lived out like behaviors that are not mentioned here. The reality is there is who you are before you come to Christ, and those things don't disappear overnight. Uh, there is this idea of putting them aside and stepping into the new life in Jesus Christ and allowing Jesus Christ to mold us and shape us and to give us all that he wants to give us and make us anew the people for the kingdom. We're called to clothe ourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is a huge idea. We aren't just encouraged to imitate Jesus. Again, we are, we are actually invited to be transformed by his presence in our life. And he will do it. And he has to do it because you and I can't do it. We can't do it. We can grit our teeth and maybe for a season have some success, but those things will come back again. But Jesus will give us the ability to overcome them permanently. And why do we do it? We had this discussion in Sunday school. Do we do this because uh, we have to do it? Otherwise, Christ rejects us and we end up in purgatory to work it off or we end up in hell because we're not really Christian? No. The whole idea behind these, uh, this idea of dressing uh, appropriately for Jesus Christ is one of gratitude for what he's done for you. We do these things because we have been saved by grace. We have been... Uh, healed by Christ in ways that we could not do for ourselves. So out of thankfulness, 
we live a different life. It's not because we have to. It's not because somehow we get a benefit from this with the Lord. No, it's I'm thankful to Jesus for living. And therefore, to show my thankfulness, I live differently in alignment with who he is and what he wants. I invite him to come into my life and mold me and shape me and change me. I invite him to give me help to guard my life against doing things that I shouldn't. That maybe I would shut up before I would open my mouth and say something unkind to someone. I would just listen instead of always having to talk because I recognize that talking gets me into trouble more than it doesn't. This is what it means to live this life and put on the armor of light and put on the Lord Jesus Christ is to maybe peacefully wait upon the Lord to give you the things to say or wait upon the Lord to give you an idea of the actions that you need to do in particular situations. And I'm not talking about waiting six months. There's some moments where you have a child in front of you and you need to deal with them accordingly, but you can deal with them out of your flesh or you can deal with them out of your spirit. But you'll need to call on the Lord in the meantime to do what is right. And you actually need to uh, produce a lifestyle where you're in a regular cycle of going to the Lord and talking to the Lord and inviting the Lord into your life so that you aren't going to get caught up in the moment of emotion and react accordingly. And that's a hard thing. That's a lifestyle change and choice, but we have to do it. In Matthew, we are told that we must love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. This was already talked about in verses 9 and 10, this idea that loving our neighbor is, is really key. This is how we fill in uh, or obey the commands of the Old Testament, loving our neighbor. If, if we do something that is not out of love, and maybe we can fool ourselves and define that this action, as rough as it might be, is really love. Well, you can do that, but I do think there is a lovingly way uh, to bring anybody back to where they need to be when it comes to Christ. I just don't think that is how we, uh, our default mode as humans is. Our default mode as humans would be to uh, chastise uh, diminish or do all kinds of things and we need to get over it we need to ask Christ for help to deal with these situations in a loving way living this out will change your life and my life it is impossible to remain in the same behavior if this is lived out as Jesus commands and as Paul encourages us to, and the Romans to do to live a life filled with love for our neighbor and filled with love for our God the great church father Augustine writes this, The rule of love is that one should wish his friend to have all the good things he wants to have himself and should not wish the evils to befall his friend which he wishes to avoid himself. He shows this benevolence to all men. No evil must be done to any. Love of one's neighbor works no evil. Let us then love even our enemies as we are commanded if we wish to be truly unconquered. Love. Love. We have to identify with Christ. Paul writes in the Galatians verse chapter 3, verse 21, uh, 27, For you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. All of you who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He says the way to deal with this issue of putting on new clothes is to identify with Christ. So you are no longer thought of as, as a racial component, not that that's not important, but that is not your core identity anymore. Whether you're slave or free is no longer your core identity. Whether you're male or female is no longer your core identity. Your core identity becomes Jesus Christ. And when that is your core identity, Christ is given the freedom to live himself out in you. He says, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When we get rid of all these kind of differentiating things, as important as they are, 
but again, they're not at our core, then we can live in community and be the kind of people and the kind of church that the Lord wants us to be. But you have to identify him with, I'm going to say it, through baptism. If you've been baptized, then I'm calling you to remember what it was all about. You died to self and to sins, and you were resurrected into new life. That's what baptism is all about. Your status was changed. Some, you went through a, a, a rite of baptism that was supposed to mirror what you went through spiritually in your heart. And there's a call to be different from that day on, if that's what you did. So I'm, if you're a baptized believer this morning, I'm asking you to remember that. If you're not a baptized believer this morning, then my question is, what's holding you back? Have you been walking with Christ for 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Why aren't you baptized? This is a public declaration of your faith. It is something for you to look to that declares that you are a different person. Jesus himself was baptized. And if it was good enough for him, I don't know why it can't be good enough for you. There's my Baptist thought for the day, sorry. Second, we're called to role play Christ in our lives. I hate role play. As an introvert, I can't stand it when we go to a conference and you're immediately asked to role play. I remember my training for foster care review board. They asked us to role play. Uh, role play the judge, Tim. I'm like, I don't know what a judge does, so this role play thing is stupid. Uh, and, you know, again, I didn't think Jesus first. Um, but anyway, but this is, you know, there has its place. And I think role play is part of this. Sometimes you got to do it, and then it becomes part of you. But it says in, the t in, in Scripture, uh, put on the new nature, created to be like God. The new nature's in you this morning if you're a Christian. You are created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So this week, let me just, just put the challenge out. What are you going to do this week? Be kind to one another. Be kind to each other. Be tenderhearted. Be forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has given you. There's a task for you this week. I'm going to bring be tenderhearted in my relationships with people. Uh, I'm going to be forgiving in my relationships with people. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be kind this week. Maybe not in all, 100% of everything I do, but I'm going to find one situation this week where I can emulate Jesus Christ and demonstrate his love. How's that for a homework session this week? Pray the words of Captain Picard of Star Trek, The Next Generation. Make it so, right? I think that's from that show. Maybe not. Thank you. At least there's one Next Generation geek over here. Make it so, Lord. Make it so that I put on the armor of light, that I put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that I peel off the dirty clothes of darkness. Make it so. Because only through Jesus Christ can you or I be transformed. He's enabled us to live this new life, this life in light. It's been given to us already. We can live it because Christ is coming soon. Time is short. We got to wake up. We have to dress appropriately. Amen. Lord, uh, be with us this week. We kind of map out our week ahead of us. We kind of know what's going to happen and some things that are going to occur. But at the same time, probably a good chance that there's going to be some prizes and some sort of circumstances that occur. We pray. I pray for us, all of us in this room, oh Lord, that 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 when these surprises occur, that we will react um, with the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, e even with the mundane things that we know are going to go on this week, I pray for us that we would react to them and carry them out in the spirit of loving our neighbors, of being tender-hearted, forgiving, and kind. Help us to do that this week, Lord. 
Help us to be able to report next week the success stories of what you've done in our lives uh, as we give praise to you in prayer next week, Lord. Help us to do that. Help us to be the people you want us to be. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and we all say amen.